Okay, well, I've tried to make the case to you that performance appraisal reviews are really important mechanisms by which we provide constructive feedback about performance to employees, both deficiencies and areas where they're excelling, and also where, how we can remunerate those deficiencies and how we can enhance those positives. And then finally, uh, it's an opportunity for us to listen to employees and gain some insights into how we might better support them going forward that will result in them receiving higher marks on their performance review and also of course that's our job it will reflect well on us because our employees will be performing at higher levels each time in part because of the rich feedback we were able to give them in the last performance review. I hope that uh, most people understand and that you see this as an obvious outcome of an effective performance appraisal review that we wouldn't just sit down with people uh, one time a year even if the perform official performance appraisal review system is annual that we would have s small talks with them reflecting on their goals for instance if we have a goal goal set with them and where they are in the achievement of those goals or if they have uh, problems you don't you don't wait until the end of the year and then make a list of all the problems and ding them is sometimes people engage in behaviors that are counterproductive, but they do it on purpose. They're not trying to be counterproductive, they just don't know the right behavior or the right activity to engage at the right time, and all they need is direction. So part of the performance appraisal uh, review system is not just a summary at the end, but it's a whole process that goes on all year. So there's different ways in which we can engage in performance appraisal review and forms that is or methodologies that we can use there's rating and ranking there's bars behavioral anchored behavioral anchored, behaviorally anchored rating scales which I'll talk about in a minute there's MBO management by objectives which is goal setting essentially there's critical incidents we can write down as we go there's 360 degree feedback where we get everyone in the organization above their peers and below the person to evaluate them, sometimes even customers where that can work. And there's uh, essays we can write, maybe even quarterly, just writing a summary essay about how this person is doing and where they're meeting their um, goals. And then finally, it's not that obscure to have organizations have an employee write a self-assessment. Oftentimes, if you ask me to evaluate my own performance, I might highlight some things that are important to me to achieve they may not be as important for the organization, but that doesn't mean they're not important. My own professional growth is determined by what efforts I'll put forward and where I want to go, how I want to grow. So the problem, of course, with ranking people is that would be when you put, here's the number one person, two, three, four, five, is that someone has to be last or someone has to be in the bottom quartile. And by definition, someone has to be first and in the top quartile. And the fact that if, if, if I'm engaged in a ranking system and I'm number one, that doesn't mean that I'm far superior to even the last person on the list. What you don't know is what the variance in those scores or how broad the top to the bottom person is. And so it doesn't give very much information, but it sends a very strong social message. The person who's at the top of the ranking thinks that they're you know, chief bottle washer the person at the bottom thinks they're going to get fired, and that may not at all be the case. So there are real limitations to any form of ranking, usually in an organization. Very seldom do we actually have a public list of people, you're number one and you're number last. We don't do that for obvious reasons, but we usually create quartiles or top 20% or just report the top quartile and the maybe the, the, the middle two quartiles from below 25% to above the bottom 25%, so in the middle there, and then the, the bottom quartile. And, um, but if we force people to be in that distribution, we're forcing people to have a performance appraisal outcome that may not really reflect their actual performance or how satisfied we are with them in the workplace. So ranking has a limited role, I think, in organizations. Rating is the, probably the most common way in which we uh, perform this process and I think that's because it's so easy. We simply get a sheet that has different um, behavioral outcomes and organizational outcomes and it says, you know, is this person conscientious and we rate it from five to one to five or one to ten or whatever the scoring sheet is 
and then maybe we write a little note or we talk to the person when we're doing the review and say, you seem conscientious, but you know, you could increase it a little bit more. The problem with the, those kinds of things is that what is conscientiousness? And if you give me an eight out of 10, out of 10 and say there is a little bit of room for improvement, what I need to know is precisely what are the two tenths that I'm missing? Was I late to work? Do I not show up on meetings on time? Do, am I not participating enough? You need to give me behavioral outcomes that I can alter so that I can get a 10 out of 10. If you can't tell me where those two tenths of a points went, then you can't rate me on that. That's my feeling. And I imagine yours, if you get eight out of 10 and you're shooting for 10, what can I do to improve that? So uh, I think conscientiousness is a fantastic construct. It's, it's, it's the reality of the workforce. People need to be conscientious, but we have to apply that to the work setting and give feedback that's rich enough that the person knows where those two tenths of a points went and what I can do to change that in the next performance period. Bars does something to begin to address that. BARS takes a, a rating system, not ranking, but a rating system, and a 10 means something, a 5 means something, and a 1 means something. So if a BARS is set up for a nurse, and the, the construct is called conscientiousness, then there's a little legend that describes 10, and what a nurse who scores 10 on conscientiousness would typically look like what their behaviors would how we'd assess their behavior so it might say uh, for a nurse working in this particular setting you know is is uh, thorough in their work meaning they uh, see a case through from the very beginning to the very end that they don't um, they don't make obviously mistakes working on a case that they um, have thorough knowledge comprehensive knowledge of patient care and that kind of stuff conscientiousness you know, description of how that nurse is prepared and conscientious in that context. And then five would be a little description where it mostly does these things, but there's been a few times when that didn't take place and it seemed like it reflect the lack of conscientiousness on the part of the nurse. And then of course the one would be a very deficient score and, you know, this would be an area to really work on. So BARS is, is helpful. It doesn't though give you the constructive information on how to change that specifically. If you don't elaborate on the bar's scores in sitting down with someone, then I'm not sure that it, it meets the criteria for the richest form of performance feedback possible. MBO, of course, is hugely po po uh, popular, primarily because we know that goal setting theory is so fundamentally and foundationally true, simply that people work harder when they're working toward the achievement of a goal than when they're not working toward the achievement of a goal. So, um, and of course, you know the dynamics of MBO are that we set these goals with the person, not just the manager doesn't tell you what goals you have, but we talk about them and come to some agreement so that there's some buy-in on your part. So that when, when we leave the performance appraisal session from last year or last quarter, whatever our time period is, you know uh, what the goals are and what how we would measure those they're measurable they're time bound and then we reward those if you reach the goals then the idea is then you get a good rating and the other positive outcomes that come with the positive performance review like pay and promotion and more responsibility in the workplace so on and so forth things we desire another thing to uh, consider doing as a manager is whether it's a part of your formal appraisal system or not, is to keep kind of some sort of an essay journal or a critical incidence. So and the difference would be an essay would be like once every month I sit down and write a paragraph about each of my employees. So that in the end of 12 months, I have 12 paragraphs that I can reflect on and I'm not going to suffer so much from the recency effect, which would be that I'm sitting here with you after 12 months of work and I have to reflect on all 12 months, more than likely I'll be overly, uh, I'll be overly influenced by the last three months of your performance than on the first three months of your performance. And that's, that's, a, that's a, um, an error that I need to overcome. So if I write essays, just a paragraph every month for every employee, then I have sort of 12 months of essays that I can just read through before I do the performance appraisal with you. 
Another way to do it in addition, you can replace that or it can be an addition. I think it's better to do it as an addition. Anytime there's a critical incident, I'm the manager and I'm, I'm watching you um, in, in the workplace and there's something that's more extraordinary, out of the ordinary, positive, or there's some kind of deficiency or problem, then I take the time to just jot down as many details as I can. After all, I'm human, so in the end of 12 months or six months or even three months, I'm gonna forget a lot of this because I don't just have you to review, I have 20, 30, 50 people that I have to do performance reviews, or even 12, it's still a lot. So I need to be documenting as I go so that I can be effective in giving you a rich feedback. 360 degree feedback has become popular. Uh, it's, it's, you have to have thick skin for that because it's asking that um, a review include a review from subordinates. And oftentimes managers feel like subordinates may view me unfavorably because my job is to make them work. I think that's probably not right. I think that a manager should understand that their job isn't to make employees work, but make employees want to work, to provide the motivational platform and framework so that the people working under them can, can aspire, so that they, from them, emanating from their own will, is a desire to do excellent work, which I think is innately present in them. And my job as a manager is to support those uh, desires and to encourage those behaviors. And then finally, I mentioned self-feedback. This, I think, is a good diagnostic tool. And it doesn't take a whole lot of time for the manager to do because you simply assign this to each person who's going to be reviewed. And then uh, they write a very short kind of, uh, you know, several paragraphs or a page, which you can scan quickly before your meeting with them, include it in uh, reflections of that in your review of them. And it basically is an opportunity to tap into what is it that you want to see developed in yourself over the, the, the next performance period? Where do you see deficiencies personally? And where do you see your great strengths? And how do you contribute most to this organization? So all these are techniques to use. And I think the best performance appraisal review systems tend to use multiple, uh, multiple methods um, par in parallel with one another. But again, and finally, all this takes time. But if a manager's job is not to take time to uh, gather information about the performance of employees and assess them and provide this in the most positive feedback they can, wherever they can, then what is a manager's job? This is what we do. We develop other people and we need tools to do it and it requires effort. I'd encourage you to take more time it's always better to overkill something like performance appraisal and review. And if you feel like it's taking far too much time and it's not having the payback that you wish it would, then you can always dial it back. But if you go through and just fill out the standardized form like most people do, you'll never know what potential you're missing in terms of the potential you have to influence your workers through a structured, thoughtful, and insightful and encouraging performance appraisal and review system. So give it a try put forth great effort initially, and if you feel like you're overkilling, dial it back.